Welcome to 80s TV Ladies. I'm Susan Lambert Haddam. And I'm Sharon Johnson. We hope you are hanging in there and finding joy. We are super thrilled to be looking at Cagney and Lacey. We have such a very special guest today who is here in our recording studio right now. And by our recording studio, we mean my garage office. That's correct. Cagney and Lacey was a groundbreaking 80s show starring Sharon Gless and Tyne Daly, that won 14 Emmys. This detective drama ran from 1982 to 1988 on CBS and examines both the cases and personal lives of two female police officers in New York City. It also spawned several TV movies. Let's get started. So to that end, our very special guest today is Tyne Daly. She is a stage and screen actress and a multi Emmy winner. She won a Tony Award for Best Actress in a Musical playing Mama Rose in Gypsy on Broadway. She has been inducted into the American Theatre Hall of Fame. She may be best known for her role as Mary Beth Lacey in television's Cagney and Lacey. She also starred as Amy's mom, Maxine, in six seasons of Judging Amy and has done multiple television appearances, stage productions, and movies. From the 1976 third Dirty Harry movie, The Enforcer, where she played a female cop, to Spider-Man Homecoming. She's also an activist and co-hosted A Night with Sharon Glass at a reading of the play Row by Lisa Loomer that was at the Fountain Theater here in Los Angeles. Tyne Daly has won six Emmys, four for Cagney and Lacey, playing Lacey, of course, one for Christy, the one season period drama, and one for Judging Amy. All right. Well, welcome to the show, Tyne Daly. Thank you so much for joining us. We're, we're very excited to ha- have this discussion with you. I'm very excited for joining because I have a very difficult time in the 21st century uh, with, with um, everything being filmed and everything being sent through the air and everything being electronic. When you get old, which I hope you do, because it's a really interesting time of life, but when you get old, there'll be a whole lot of stuff to adjust to that you will not have seen before. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you. I'm already finding that things that are happening where I just find myself going, I don't understand the need for this or why we should be pushed to that or what the heck is that, you know, and why is anybody interested kind of thing? Well, I think I began to tell you, I'm I'm asking people to give me one word on the 21st century so far. We're not we're not a quarter of a century, old century. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We're moving in on it, though, but a little assessment about if you had to find a descriptive, if you were a poet, for instance, a thing to say this century, you get one word. It's very tricky. Oh, yeah, it is. Oh, well, my you don't goodness. have to answer immediately. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> However, gonna, perhaps at the end, at of, the our end time, of our time, you can give me, okay. because I, I feel, and if you'd like to know mine now, I'll tell it to you. Yes. Right? Or I could wait. Well, we, we, we we could, let's we wait. Compare. Should we'll we wait? At the end. Let's wait. Okay. Cause okay. I, so where are we now? Okay. Well, all right. I do want to talk about the beginning of your career first, if we can. Um, sure. You come from an acting family. I went in the family business. Uh, on base, it was the only way to get their attention. Uh, there was a there was a young uh, there was a theater, a, a local theater, the Antrim Players, from the place we moved after. Well, there was a lot of schools before that. We moved around a lot. When we settled down in Suffern, New York, there was the Antrim Players, which just closed their doors forever, which makes me very sad. Oh, oh my goodness. goodness. They're going to turn into a church. Oh, dear. And um, But they had a program for kids and, uh, and for grown-ups, and I got to escape there and do my apprenticeship. You know? uh, and then uh, played there a little bit. Then the parents, you know, they were parents. They... they they wanted me to go to college. <laughs> they, they wanted me to finish high school. I mean, Whatever. they were said they were so they pinched me so hard because by the time I got to the Antrim Players, I wanted to do it all. So I did. I finished high school barely uh, on the good graces of a, of a history teacher who said basically, "Oh, get out of here," you know, <laughs> with your with your D minus. <laughs> <laughs> I went to uh, Brandeis University for a quick year because there was a man from American history of the theater named Jasper Dieter. Jasper great Dieter. Name. Either a ball player or theater, right? One or the <laughs> other. Uh, Jasper Dieter. And uh, 
that he was gone after my freshman year as a teacher, although I learned a great deal from him. He was one of my lucky teachers. Um, and then I found out they weren't going to let me on the stage until I was a junior. Really? So the hell you say? So I went home to the parents and said, I quit college, send me to trade school. Went to trade school, met my husband, got married, got pregnant, came out here. Uh, I had done a couple of plays in New York um, quickly and a couple of seasons of summer stock. Um, and I got out here and called in all of the connections that I had and none of them paid off. What was the impetus for, because you wanted to work in movies and television. Is that what was it? Or did you want to I wanted work? to follow my young husband and for us to raise up our baby together. Yes. And I didn't want to leave New York at all. <laughs> okay. This was foreign territory and in many ways still is. Because this is a movie. T- this is the movies. New York is the theater. This is the movies on those terrible, mm-hmm. you know, dichotomies that we are forced to do. But um, I tried to find theater out here. I did do some theater out here, but I felt that I was leaving the theater town forever. And I was, I was in mourning for that because that was what I had fantasized about. Broadway, Broadway, mm-hmm. how great yeah. you are. Not the, not the, the uh, silver screen. That was for ideals in that day and age. It was only for ideal people. Oh, okay. And they, uh, they cried ideally and they suffered ideally and they made love with a certain amount of cool, just cool, not hot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Coolness was the big, I wasn't any of those things uh, and I wasn't going to be. But the luck of timing, which they don't talk to you about in acting school, was that we hit the Dustin Hoffman. We hit the real people time. Mm. We hit, you could look like a person. We let, you didn't have to wear your bra. We, <laughs> we hit a wave. Mm-hmm. Yes. Know? As did my young husband, who hit the wave of, of the inclusion of black people for the first time in a very long time. Mm-hmm. Yes. So the luck was, was, was those cultural timings, both for the women's movement and for the social revolution of race. Mm-hmm. And in that sense, we were very lucky. And then we did the work, and then I was middle-aged. I was 34 years old. I was done. <laughs> Come on. Who's that wonderful, wonderful? Who, who directed um, Some Like It Hot? Oh, Billy, uh, Billy Wilder. Wilder. Yeah, Billy Wilder famously said, there's only one thing for a woman to do in Hollywood after 30, and that's leave town. <laughs> <laughs> and he was one of the nice ones. <laughs> They were exploiting little girls from 12, like you know, the Gish sisters, mm-hmm. all the way up. But n- nobody wanted to take a look at anything that wasn't smooth and mm-hmm. white and feminine. Let me put some quotation marks around that. No threat to the patriarchal feminine idea. And the ugly people were allowed. The, the mm-hmm. non-perfect people were kind of in fashion. So I was just definitely not perfect. I, I feel like in the movies, I couldn't pass the physical. Movies like the Marines. Yeah. In terms of your assignment, mm-hmm. you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a requirement for a certain kind of strict adhering to the rules. And I was really much more interested in being a mash unit. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Just oh, they were get awesome. in. <laughs> yeah. get um, help people, patch them up because they've been hurt. Oh. When you first came to L.A., though, did you find much uh, to your liking of the theater community here? Or was it? fairly non-existent at that time. Um, we made a couple of theaters. Mm-hmm. We made a wonderful little theater on, uh, in the valley that was this little space. We did some very esoteric plays. We did ball. <laughs> and, we did, and, and it was fun because we turned it into a sweet little theater. This is when there was a under 100 and then yes. under, you know, and you could still yeah. get a dispensation from your union. Mm-hmm. Some of us were union C women, theater, you know, workers. Yeah. And some were, you know, milkmen. At any rate, when we lost that theater after two seasons, we had to turn it back into a storefront. It was heartbreaking. <laughs> it was this <laughs> sweet little theater with things in the little box office and all this stuff. Moore do, Park, do you remember Moore the Park. name of it? No. It was on Moore Park. Um, who was in it, uh, interestingly, was David, uh, what's his name? Starsky. They oh. used to call it Cagney and Lysa Gillespie, which of you and I'd say Starsky. Uh, <laughs> Starsky. <laughs> and David, sheepers, it'll come to me. This is why... I David Soul. David Soul. I'm going to help Soul. you out with the internet and Thank technology. You very much. Okay. <laughs> That's cheating, though. That's the death of conversation, that machine. Because people are, you know, what's his name? Who's in that movie with them? Um, you know, she was married to, um, oh, that fellow who did the thing that he was doing. <laughs> he worked for, um, you yeah. know, at that studio. Uh, well, we yeah. know what At the place yeah, behind, yeah, the, we're the, done. behind the we're car. Done. With the, we're yeah. finished. Yeah, this, we never we, get we've to laughed have this about this, Mike and Temperance and I. You've got another. 
10 years, you've got another nine. <laughs> nine? <laughs> Years before your brain leaves. <laughs> oh no, oh, no, no! no it's no. already le- it's already leaving the station. It's 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 <laughs> down, it's on its way. Trust me. Oh, yes. ladies. <laughs> so we were speaking of culture. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, being lucky. What happened before that? So I did I did ten years here of freelancing on television mm-hmm. and getting jobs through my connections and through having you know delivered on those connections. You know, but the getting the job is is hard. My dad had a show. My husband had a show. Your husband was in the rookies, right? He was in the rookies. We were were talking about Aaron Spelling, too. In those paternal, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, producers who could announce at the end of their season, there would be another season. Everybody has a job. Go on vacation, go on (laughs) hiatus and have a good time. So them days are over. Uh, um, I had done a couple of pilots for various proposed series Mm -hmm. and gone home and fallen on my knees and prayed to my maker not to have it sell. Please don't make me have to do that for another 15 minutes, much less, you know, five years. I got lucky in the movies a couple of times, but that didn't pan out to be anything um, in terms of work. I was approached by my agent with a script called Caddy and Lacey. And I said, uh, I, I did my, I did my cop. I did my cop with, with uh, Eastwood. Mm-hmm. The enforcer. It's done. I, I, yeah. That's, that's over, you know. And um, he said, read it. And I read it and I thought, oh, there's room in here for something else size run and gun and yeah and every and the other thing was that i'm by that time was a little bit smart about the business i thought every single actress in this town is going to throw a blonde wig on her head and want to play cagney because <laughs> cagney's glamorous mm-hmm. and cagney's mm-hmm. funny and cagney is sharp in a very specifically second wave feminist way <laughs> yes <laughs> which Shelf life, I'm not so sure. Uh, but anyway, so I thought, I thought, I actually thought um, uh, Mary Beth was more interesting, had more possibilities in terms of a long run thing. And then we did it, and then it wasn't appreciated. Uh, well, it got good numbers with Loretta. Got very yeah, good numbers movie, because Loretta was with hotter than a pistol playing Hot Lips Hula Hand. Right. And so it was her, they owed her a movie of the week like they did to sweeten contracts then. Uh, and uh, yeah, it got a sensational numbers. It's got sixty something. It doesn't happen anymore. No, yeah. but there wasn't an inkling in doing the TV movie that there might be a series in this. Not to me. I thought mm-hmm. it was a one-off. Mm-hmm. You okay. know. Um, and um, so we we had no contract for it. So then this this uh, network who lives and dies on math, which is the difference actually between the theater and, and the movies. Uh, the theater is is n- words. Mm-hmm. And the movies is numbers. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, just by the way, um, so they got impressed and they went to Barney and they said, where's our series? Maybe he told you this story. Yeah. And he said, I don't have daily. I don't have Swit. What do I do now? They said, well, it's Swit's tied up in her series doing the 11th year, I believe, of MASH. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> they said, get daily, you know. So we, we, we came to a deal and started looking for a new, um, a new Cagney. And... Then they told me the long history of who they'd wanted in the first place and blah, blah, blah. That's a long, that's a yeah. 11 times told tale. But, but, you, <laughs> but, but so then you did the first season with Meg Foster yes. as, as Cagney. Yeah. And like, this was your second run as Lacey. What changed for you for that character between the movie and the, and the show? And then with the different Cagneys? I'd been playing with the big boys and I'd had to make compromises. Personal ones. Personal ones. About uh, loyalties and about advancing my own career and about, um, yeah, I, I, it, was, it, was a, it was a very tough time because Meg and I had worked well together yeah. and we had done what you, um, television series don't spring full blown from the mind of Zeus. Right. <laughs> There's an idea, you do it and then... As Amy Brennan once said to me famously, she called me up after after we were picked up for judging Amy. She said, I know what it is now, Tino. We have to keep doing these. <laughs> I said, yeah, maybe. <laughs> we do at least 12. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, whole, it's a whole different animal. So I thought we were done and we weren't done. And I was, I was for about a minute and a half, well, or a week and a half, in on the casting process of the mm. new... Cagney, Mm -hmm. and I was still aching from uh, Megan and I, uh, uh, Meg and I, because I thought we'd sort of started to figure it out. Yeah. But there wasn't any start to figure it out. There was deliver, 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 you Mm -hmm. know. So 
Oh, after that, sitting with these, listening to these people audition these these actresses, all of whom I admired. Mm-hmm. I mean, any of the smart ones said, oh, that's a good part. I'd like to have that part. We don't see those parts very much in TV, you know. And they all came in and, and they read. And after the first day and a half of my reading with them, I said, fellas, I can't stay in this room with you when these actresses leave. I cannot listen to you. Speak about these women mm. and these workers. Mm-hmm. I will go down and get them from the waiting tank and I'll bring them down to you and we'll read together and then I'm leaving. Because I did not have the soul of a boss. Yeah, I, yeah, I was brutal. Do that to my heart. <laughs> it was, I, my Passion shoulder hurt move. from trying to protect them physically from yeah. these assaults on their personhood that to me had very little to do with acting. At any rate. So I'd had an encounter with the powers that be. Yeah. And I'd been threatened with um, a court if I broke my contract. Mm. And um, <laughs> what was his name? Harvey, P- Harvey, not Harvey Purr. That's a play, right? Harvey Lacey, that was my husband. Harvey Weinstein, <laughs> that was a bad guy. Uh, <laughs> one of those Harveys. One of those. Uh, uh, Harvey. He said to me over lunch at some very fancy place, I was knitting, like a mad thing at brought my knitting. He said, well, would you like to be working for me next year or would you like to be in court? Is this because you were like... I was saying, I was trying I to say, I, was saying, Meg, I went into Meg, Meg. Meg over Meg. I said, mm. we've laid the groundwork. We've done our thing. Yeah. We, you know, we're just beginning to roll with it. This is going to work. It's going to be great. She's a, she's a, she's she's, a team player. She's, she's in. Yeah. She's my Cagney. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Little did we know. Anyway. Oh, wow. the, oh, God. It's a long time ago. And the struggles were real and the struggles were mostly about trying to make a better product. Right. From everybody, I think. Now I'm a little kinder. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but at the time, you know, since you were so personally involved, this is your, you're going to be your, literally your partner yeah. on the show. And it's, it, it, yeah, it's, it's not just a, it's hard to be, um, to be objective about it in that way yeah. because it's different for you than for the producers and everybody else involved. Well, people say often don't take it personal, whatever it is. This is very personal work. Yeah. This is my instrument. Here it is sitting mm-hmm. in front of you size, shape, age, whatever. This is what I have to work with. And my brain and my memories and my guts and all those things. And it is personal work. And it's about, and it doesn't work if someone doesn't pick up on how personal it is to you and feels that same way too. It becomes personal mm-hmm. for the person you're telling the story to. And that stuff is, that's, that's tricky stuff. You know, no wonder half of us go mad and turn into drunks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll admit until we started doing this podcast and started looking at Cagney and Lacey, either I didn't know or I just didn't remember that Sharon Glass was Cagney number three yeah. in the show. Well, was it, you didn't need to. Um, that's good. Mm-hmm. That's very good. She became, she became the one. She said they were the one they wanted in the first place. And she was tied up in a series of her own. We had met a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Um, I went to full courtship because I wanted the job for myself. Come on. I wanted it to work. I didn't right. want it to fall apart. Right. Do you know? Anyway, you know, and then we were fired and then we were hired and then there were prizes and we were fired again. <laughs> you know, it was, it was a really nice, uh, chunky roller coaster. <laughs> I was going to say for such a successful series from the outside, it had a very tumultuous history we yeah. learned from Barney and from in, reading about the show and yeah. stuff. And so I imagine being in the middle of it just trying to do your job Mm -hmm. (laughs) and being surrounded by whether we're going or not going, who we're going with, who is being handed to us. Well, and more, and the more difficult assignment was to be some kind of a example or a role model or, you know, what do we stand for? How do you account for the success of this show? When we go to actors and we put, stick the microphone in their face and we want them to know stuff that isn't often in their can. And sometimes they're deeply stupid about and I want to say, go talk to the people you elected. Don't, what are you talking to me for? Why do you want my opinion about this? You know, uh, do I have one? Sure. No, I don't think it's appropriate for you to be asking me about this. Ask me about what I do. At any rate, um, that was very annoying to me. I didn't, you know, and the, the part where you're supposed to represent something. It's at this point that Miss Daly notices the Jimmy Stewart retrospective poster on the wall of my office. There's Jimmy Stewart right up on the wall. Look, hi, yes. James. So I, 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 um, Sorry. I went to USC film school and organized a retrospective of Jimmy Stewart movies because I wanted to see them. Yes. And I got to meet him too. At yes. the last, it was, 
it was really again an incredible memory and he was so kind and gracious that he was a ex- lovely man yeah it did, was, you, did you did you go around when he did his show and talked about his past and all that stuff no i wasn't videos? out here then but <laughs> yeah God. it's a strange deal for actors actors and all performing artists although we have film and although we have all of that recording devices you only serve in your own time mm-hmm. i i could not have served in the 30s and bet Betty, uh, uh, Betty, Betty Davis, Davis could mm-hmm. not serve now. Couldn't get a job. You know, I, I mean, yeah. you know, the, the styles change. I had a very smart friend who said to me once, "Styles change, but the truth does not." Mm. So you can see the truth tellers, you know, in the movies and the theater. And I think it's one of the Cagney like, and Lacey holds up, and it I does. think it's because yeah. you guys are truthful in your moments. There's truthful moments. That's what we were working Cagney for. And yeah. And it know? comes through. And, and there's a whole lot of bullshit too. I mean, yeah, there's, 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 but, it, but, but, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, but the end of the season, we used to get to a point, me and Marnie Rosen's wife, and we'd say, okay, so this year we did 22 or 24, or whatever. And, and uh, which ones would you keep? Hmm. If you would keep eight, you were doing great. If you keep 11. That was a very good season. <laughs> if, you know, and if and it was going down into the round, like, well, I, I'm not proud. Uh, then we were, then we jumped the shark. Then it gotten silly. Then we were grasping at straws. And I wish we were more then like the English are, uh, you know, to say this, this story has a finite yes. uh, amount of time to tell. Yeah, I'm of two minds of that though, because as a television consumer Mm -hmm. and a lover of television, I'm happy to spend as much time as I possibly can with these characters that I like, these shows that I enjoy. But at the same time, it is nice when it, you know, the, the, the expression about going away before you're missed or, or before oh, yes, you, right, you yes, know, right. let them miss you as opposed right, to I, want you to go leave away. Leave them basically. wanting more. Yes, <laughs> exactly. I understand that as well. I, I, so I'm, I'm always of two minds when it comes to that. Um, uh, Cause yes, I, I would love to spend as much time with characters that I enjoy and shows that I enjoy mm-hmm. as I possibly can. But when you're doing 22, 24 episodes a season, they're not all going to be, you know, keepers because of the runaway train that is television production. Yeah. You know, so there's just not a lot of time for, for that. <laughs> but it's it, but it's so lovely. Well, when my daddy started doing series television, they did 39 episodes a year. That oh. was one of the, the hiatus was 52 weeks, cut in quarters, 39 episodes, hours. And he, yeah, and he was, on an, he was yeah. on an hour show. And yeah. so then I saw it slip for him when he was going out to the coast and it became 36 and then 34 and then 28 that was a big dip, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and now, uh, but it's changed again. Now yes. it's six, <laughs> and 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 maybe uh, uh, eleven was what I was thinking about about yeah. the Sopranos. Eleven. How did you yeah. know all that same money, all that same amount of time? Time and money makes things excellent. Yeah. But um, yes, we had when Sharon and I did three shows together. They showed two of them on television. And then Barney begged to have the third one also shown, you know. And my friends thought I was lucky because they were only making two of which. It's the business. I know far more about this business than I want to. I never wanted to know anything about show business. I wanted to pretend to be somebody else. And so, like, I think that's not uncommon uh, impulse. Um, uh, I wanted to disappear into Mm -hmm. somebody else and show off at the same time. See, that's... Oh, yeah. <laughs> look at me, don't look at me. <laughs> it's one of the nice dichotomies. I used to say, you know, the impulse to show off and the willingness to disappear. But in terms of reality television, if I was remotely interested in reality, you think I would have been an actor? <laughs> no. <laughs> Let's pretend and have dress up. <laughs> Let's have fantasy land. <laughs> Old school. So that reminds me of the, an interview that that I watched with you where you talked about one of the first things you do is find the voice of the character and your voice is so amazing. Right. But I love that thought that that's how you approach. Well, it's not so much as finding the voice is it is hearing her and, and the, the hearing of her doesn't come just out of my brain alone or, or auditory hallucinations, as we say. Um, it's um, it comes from the page. It comes from the, from the written what's on the page and I, um, I'm, as I said, I'm not a visual, I'm an aural learner. We used to don't talk about that. They just started talking about that with my little girls. What kind of a learner is she? Slow. Uh, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> or, um, so yeah, I often, um, music, 
the 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 auditory thing um, is a, a stimulus for me more than the visual. Whereas my young husband George, I used to catch him, you know, standing in doorways, staring into space, and I knew he was directing. I knew he was, you know, seeing it, trying to envision it. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I, I, it, you know, I'm just I'm sort of fascinated by diff- actors' different approaches to creating these characters, and and Mary Beth is such a subtle character in a lot of ways. Much yeah. more than Cagney. Cagney is sort of through the door first, I guess. Yes, right. Well, maybe in cliche, she, uh, Cagney's a little more uh, available, you know, because she's more showy. Lacey, I just liked her. And I also thought she was doing a struggle that now I was involved in myself, but on the, on a being an actress level, not on being a housewife and with a second job at, you know, the local hotel cleaning rooms. Yes. I mean, uh, um, she was trying to do that particular juggling act. Mm-hmm. I'm not getting yes. to it. Uh, you know, of the of the eighties woman. Uh, you can have it all. And uh that wasn't true. You certainly can't have it all at once. You can have it all very quickly one after another if you are uh, have an endless supply <laughs> of energy and good temper. Um yeah. She was throwing herself up against a bunch of walls. Yeah. With her husband and her kids, mm-hmm. and her work, that I thought was worth telling stories about. And then, what do you know, a whole lot of people wanted to hear stories about themselves on TV. What a surprise! <laughs> I know. <laughs> and and um, They and wanted it, to see themselves reflected. <laughs> they wanted to see women being real in their lives. And everybody else, and everybody too. Else. It was, I mean, it was, yeah. it's, 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 again, it's a crack in the... I'll read the statistics of our union still. This, the, how many stories are told about the white male in the society? And, it's, and we, we reflect, some people think television leads. I'm not so sure. I think we reflect. I think a lot of what we were talking about on Cagney and Lacey had been talked about in the world, you know. But here we are again mm. with people, you know, um, assaulting clinics that take care of women's health. With people marching in the streets saying, we matter, can you see us? With people confused about the, well, police to have played a policeman? Both my husband and I played policemen in those days. And if you think we didn't go home and discuss and decide to accept that in them days, then you underestimate both of us because uh, it was not easy to say, I'm lining up with the pigs. Not only been marching with, with for Vietnam and meaning it, you know, compromises. Yeah, the end of the Vietnam War was really not that far away mm-hmm. from when no, no, Cag- and all the things that went yeah. on, you know, no. uh, around it um, mm-hmm. was not that far away. So it's it's totally understandable. The but- entertainment industry yes. for peace and justice. <laughs> <laughs> the worst. Uh, what are those things that NATO's the one that those things into a word? The EIPJ. Oh. <laughs> oh. Jane Fonda and uh, Don Sutherland yeah. and us with carriages in the street, you know, street theater, all that stuff. And we'd be back. I just did street theater again. Oh, really? Sort of. Sharon and I introduced a play by uh, Lisa Loomer called uh, Roe v. Rome. Wade. That's, you know, here, here <laughs> yes, you know, to a bunch of people, to a hundred people in a thing saying, don't give up the ship. Um, it's, it's disheartening. And yet, I know there's progress, mm-hmm. uh, but only progress if you if you if you um, insist on it. Yeah, yeah. The fight never stops for a lot of things. You have to keep you have to keep fighting. So I just don't. I, I'm not a. I, yeah, my version of fighting because I'm not very. Um, I don't have a very aggressive spirit. Mm-hmm. So my version is storytelling. Yeah, and um, I think human beings need stories. I don't think it, I, sometimes I think, oh, I've spent too much time with words. I've wasted my time with too many words. And I'm still looking for the right words. I still call up my friends and say, you want to hear a poem? You know, I, I just, uh, and I know that that can be not as useful as deeds, words and deeds. Well, I think everybody has to contribute what they can at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. Everybody I'm, can't do everything. Words, um, or words be everything. are very powerful, Absolutely. which we're seeing the policing of words and we're seeing you don't get to call yourself what you want to call yourself. And mm-hmm. we're seeing, so words are very, very, very powerful. Yeah. And you know, it's the first amendment. Well, freedom from fear. 
freedom from fear. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're going to take a little break. We'll be back. All right, welcome back. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, did we get up to uh, Cagney and Lacey? What do you want to talk about? Oh, we want to talk uh, about Cagney and Lacey. Talk more about Cagney and Lacey. And, you know, what your favorite moments were. Like, what you still hold dear. Hmm. I don't, when at the end of the show, um, uh, they gave us an opportunity to have all of the um, episodes, the entire series. And it was a choice between Betamax and... VHS, yes, VHS. Yes, yes. I didn't understand it, but I did do a little research. I found out Betamax was smaller and better resolution, both visually and audioly. Mm. So I said, I'll have Betamax. So I haven't seen Caddy and Lacey in 40 years. Um, and uh, not really interested in it. Um, <clears throat> looking at oneself is a mixed bag. And, and, and uh, Sharon will tell you, maybe, or. Uh, you know, she used to sit down with with um, Monique James, who was her mentor at Universal, and they'd watch dailies. And Monique would say to her, "And that's that's good. I like that when you do that. Don't 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 ever do that. Watch out when you do that thing with your don't don't do that." And and talked her through how to look, and it was just um, foreign to my nature. Yeah. Um, I thought for a while I'd look at the shows and Barney said it was an interesting opportunity to see if, you know, if you'd made a table that had four good legs or one yeah. leg was short, you could assess the the work. But the opportunity to really see yourself when you're making it was very rare. There wasn't any TiVo or look at it afterwards. I remember looking at um, dailies every once in a while from a scene I was interested in for a while because we had the whole operation at Lacey Street, which was a old brick factory that they turned into a studio with everything. Uh, the first year or so, season or so, we, we didn't have the sound department, but we had the writers upstairs and we had the cutters downstairs and we had the costume department. It was all kind of a self-contained uh, little factory of our own. Um, we didn't have to report to Universal. And if the powers would be called up and said, oh, we hate that scene. You can't do it anymore. And she said, oh, sorry, we filmed it. Oh, too bad. Oops. <laughs> Shot. <laughs> and then they were too cheap. To <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it was um, a lovely cocoon in, mm. in a way out there. But um, collecting favorite moments. Uh, the, I don't, I, you don't do it. I don't do it, really. I know that I had very good times working with a particular director or on a storyline. Um when we were being the heroes and then as the thing went on there were there was the victim requirement people had to be date raped and people had to have breast cancer and people had to have you know the things that were the the victimhood of the female cop was not required from some of our colleagues with penises if i could mm -hmm. say that but um and that was that was another interesting thing to negotiate i remember a uh, yeah, you know, trapped in the in the thing we did called heat when you the bad guy trapped you in the in the in the hot uh, being a victim. I um yeah. There were good acting opportunities. I like the the quieter ones. Um but it's it's painful to me to try and name you episodes. I've t I'm t I mean, yeah. we picked out did they work or did they don't work? A very yeah. smart man named Arthur Lawrence whom I encountered later as a director, an old fox of the theater. And he said to me, there's no right and wrong in the theater. Does it work or not? Does it work or it doesn't work? You know? So I think we worked it, mostly. Mm -hmm. I don't feel that there were times when we really <laughs> betrayed the side or something. There were a couple of stupid episodes, you know? But they were mostly just relief from, you know, now I've done 20 of these, let's do something silly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we did a lot of laughing together as workers. We had yeah. a good, good tight crew you know who who knew each other for for i mean we lost people but but that they held together mostly um you had some really um you had a, a for the time a number of female directors and writers we, did. we tried consciously to hire female directors and ad's and stuff and to and to help on that you know front in terms of technology which it um, i don't know if you remember karen arthur of course I we're going to be talking arthur. to her yes <laughs> um, she's in new york now as yeah. far as i know last time i saw her was in new york yeah well yeah. I, think, I think she'll be zooming in so yeah. i don't know exactly oh, good, where she okay. is but yeah 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 she was one of our regulars so you mentioned you were talking about how you really never really watched the show if i'm remembering correctly yeah so is that consistent ac across the work that you've done on film and television that you haven't gone back and after you finished it gone back and watched it 
Pretty much so. Mm-hmm. I mean, in the in the we had a couple of movies, a handful of movies that I've done. Uh, uh, some directors have dailies in the olden days, um, which was kind of another communal activity. You know, come and have drinks after the thing and 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 watch the day's work. Um, God, it's such weird work because because there's no because I prefer the theater where you don't have to look at yourself. When they look at you, and in fact, they're not even allowed to take your picture unless they're doing it on the sneak, do you know it has to live in the memory of you and the person you were telling the story to? Mm -hmm. So the non-communalness of this last couple of years, which is changing our business of law, of um, gathering any place and gathering with comfort and ease and rather than suspicion and nervousness and wondering if if going to the movies is going to make you sick... uh, that's something I'm kind of looking at from the margins because I'm not, but I have done enough work to see how different it is. I did, uh, um, this guy wants to know about, about uh, burn notice. I, and I have to tell you, the reason I did it was to keep my pension open. My pension had faded. And I called Sharon. I said, Sharon, I got to make this much money to do my pension. Get me a job. And I mean, this is, this is mm-hmm. let, let, if you want to know about how it really works, folks, <laughs> you get to be old and they kick you to the curb. Okay. So um, uh, what was I going to tell you about something though? Uh, theater and theater and yeah the recording of an experience Mm -hmm. so that you can look at it again and again is very different than having it have to last in your memory right and you could retrieve what you can and uh i understand that you know there are kids who are recording their teachers in Mm -hmm. college class instead of taking notes Taking notes is one kind of recording but recording the whole thing and did then go what fall asleep over it again uh, I, I I think it's an excuse for paying attention in many ways, and that makes me sound like an alta caca, which I am. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm probably <laughs> pretty far down that road too. I mean, as as you know, as, as cell phones have proliferated, I when I first was able to take pictures all the time and as many as I wanted, I, uh-huh. I did that. I'm gotten to the point now where I almost never take pictures when uh-huh. I go places <laughs> because I want to see an experience and yeah. I want to look at what I want to look at and pay attention to what I want to look right. at because I there is something about being in that moment. And that's one of the beauties of theater over over film. As much as I love film and television and filmed entertainment. And it's lovely to see things again. It is. Mm-hmm. It is Absolutely. wonderful to see great performances and all that stuff. I don't mean to be to be religious about it. But there I mean I think there have been a number of actors who've talked about how they don't watch themselves. They don't so you're definitely not alone. Yeah. Um and I, so I was just I was just curious if that was <laughs> A you know something yeah. consistently over your 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 career that you've mostly done when it came to the f- the finished product you know as opposed to dailies which to me is a little different because you're seeing the work of the day and helping you know that may be useful in terms of going forward I don't know but I have I think I have only like eight percent sunset boulevard in me. <laughs> <laughs> just enough it's just, that's just you enough know, uh, yeah not, 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 not my favorite form of fun mm-hmm. let's say that no, understandable <laughs> sure so let's move on to theater because I want to talk about Gypsy and I want to talk about what theater has meant to you over the years and because you've done a ton of theater I've done some, but I also had, there was this distraction of, mm-hmm. of, of my husband's career was out yeah. here. My career turned out to be about television and, and a little bit of a way, you know, the movies where I couldn't pass the physical yeah. and uh, 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 to be a Marine, which I, I remember the, <laughs> reading something about uh, Demi Moore. Mm-hmm. Uh, saying that she was a hands-on mom, and she also spent eight hours a day in the gym. I thought, baby, how do you do that? Do you do that? <laughs> Which eight? All in a row? How many hands? <laughs> I don't know. I just didn't. I, I, it was. Yeah. It was made. It amused me. Um, anyway, I couldn't figure out that kind of juggling w- without a lifestyle that I didn't mm-hmm. wasn't designed for. Do you know? I'm very bad at delegating responsibilities and asking other people to do my shopping. <laughs> Um, (laughs) so the theater and the movies i've been very lucky i've gotten to do some of each do you know and and uh uh but my yearnings for my dream time as i said was the theater not the movies not to be on the silver screen but to be but to be in uh, you know on the broadway stage and the music part was fun and getting up for it was fun and and uh uh retraining again uh uh you know to make the cabarets was fun and um so I didn't. I wasn't required to choose to say to do this yeah. or this. I was happier being a jack of all trades. And I think that was um, 
that has changed. It used to be you were doing television, you did television. If you did movies, you oh, did yeah. movies. Oh, if yeah. You did theater, there was a lot theater. more snootsiness about it until um, Lawrence Olivier sold p- p- cameras. Oh, okay. <laughs> Until old Larry got that ad for Polaroid. <laughs> yeah, there were inroads were made on yes. what was the fancy stuff. Um, and, you know, um, where you earn the, the monies and where they want you. Um, so, and the theater takes a different a different kind of energy. I don't I don't know that I could do the first act of Gypsy without falling over, you know, these days. It's just you age out of, of that mm-hmm. part of it. Um and the memory fades, and the you know, and the and the and the, 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 the attrition of old age. But but hopefully, I always wanted. I was interested in in telling stories about women from the beginning to the end. I didn't like cutting out and leaving only the fifteen years between fifteen and thirty. Yeah. That those were the only ones we looked at. <laughs> Fifteen and thirty. Yeah. yeah. No coming. Very few coming of age things for girls. Yeah. Uh, very few getting through the middle passage for girls. Yeah. Very few after I can't make you babies for the girls, and very few um, uh, old wise hags. To add a little bit of the female spirit to the overbalance of of uh, uh, male stories about. Um, how they figured out the world and how they run the world and what is necessary to run the world. I had a thought the other day um, about the Bible and the and the and the Constitution and all of the things that are rolling around since mm-hmm. in our society right now and the words, the great words. And I thought to myself, I wanted to say to the founding fathers, "Who told you that story?" And they'd say, "Oh, my dad." Mm-hmm. And I say, "Well, who told him that story?" And they say, "Oh, my dad." Your dad told you that story. We've all been listening to the dad stories for a long, mm-hmm. long time on the verge, version of what's creative, what's nurturing, how do we get to be better people, you know. And um, so I thought there was room for the mom stories, yeah. particularly the mom, not the girlfriend <laughs> yeah. and not the rival for the, for the job. Well, it was such a big part of, of, of Lacey. And, mm-hmm. and there, I, there's a... Um, Again, rewatching these, there was a line that struck me from one of the episodes where, where she, and she constantly questioned whether she was being a good mom, but there was like a, I thought I was stronger than this. I thought I was a good mother as a mother and a stepmother and a working person and a thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like I was like, yes, we're constantly asking that question of ourselves. Yeah, serving all these masters and 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 wondering if you're failing them all. It was a condition and still is a condition of 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 a lot of people. And I know that it's not that men don't question themselves or that they don't blah blah blah, but the, but the running of everything. And the recent being instructed that I'm a second class citizen officially mm. now from the highest court in the land is painful to me. And my daughters and their daughters and their sons. You see, <laughs> If you can announce that somebody's a second class citizen officially again, you could pick, take your next group. There's mm-hmm. that, you know, who do they come for next? There's that thing uh, mm-hmm. uh, to say your personhood is in question. Your citizenship is in question. Your value to the community is in question. So I'm, I, I, Lacey had a hard time with that in the 80s and Daly's having a hard time with that in the, two, in the, in the 20s. Uh, yeah. As are we all. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's, you know, one of the reasons, you know, we sort of have this little saying like, look back in order to leap forward. Mm-hmm. And yet we're tripping sideways, like in backwards and, and forwards. Like it's, it seems like a, a bit of a hot mess right now. Yeah. Well, maybe it's always a hot mess. I just, um, it's the idea that you, and it's, it applies to the acting game, right? It's the idea that, that you've arrived someplace and now you're there. And that's it. That's the end of the story. You've got to this platform and then you don't have, and no, it's an ongoing thing. There's on back, the whole ebb and flow and blah, blah, all that stuff is, is, is happening in our country and happens in the career. So when you get to something, you say, okay, this is it. This is what I do. You know, I live in New York City and I do bad plays. Oh, no, this is what I do. <laughs> I go and sell out in Hollywood and make money and win prizes and get famous. And that's, you know, uh, and that's, and that's it for, no, there's no arriving. 
and how to be of service. I always wanted this to be a service job. That's how I was brought up. Human beings tell stories to each other about themselves because they need it. Yeah. And more importantly than that for me was, you know, human beings come to the theater to watch actors because they've all been actors. All of them. Mm -hmm. Even the starving ones have pretended to be somebody else and to get themselves out of this condition and have played dress up and have, you know, shown off. They, they all, and they've all forgotten. We're the ones who remember how to, how, to, how to play dress up and show off and be silly. And, and they come to get that from us, you know. But there's no, there's no arrival at some law. We were so innocent that we thought we would change the laws and we forgot they could be changed back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As, a, as a generation, I think. Mm-hmm. Our hippy-dippy, you know, against the war and all this stuff. We thought we were the only people that marched on Washington. Yeah. <laughs> Ever. We forgot all about them Civil War soldiers who never yeah. got their pension. <laughs> no sense, you know, and history shows us that you have to gonna go out again and again and again. Again. You again, have again, to again. keep fighting yeah. for your rights. You yeah. have to keep fighting constant yeah. and, and and fighting is an interesting word, right? We you know Striving, struggling, striving. questioning, uh, challenging. I like all those. My mama said to me one time, I hate all this stuff on TV. Everything's a fight. You're fighting ring around the collar, and you're fighting the yellow on your floor, and you're fighting the, you know, t- you're cold with this medicine, and everything is pitched as a battle. And I thought, that's really interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a hell of a long time ago. But yeah, the idea that of, of um, combat. Yeah. And aggression and struggle. I think we sort of run out of that being useful. Yeah. I think that anybody that thinks that war is a solution to anything is wrong. Yeah. Period. Period. Got to figure something else out. We got to do it. Guys. We got to look for different ways. <laughs> and I think that's, that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this podcast is I wanted to celebrate women mm-hmm. in all ways. And, and, also examine what our choice of language is like we we sort of question each show that we look at mm-hmm. and we go like okay is this a feminist show what is a feminist show mm-hmm. did they know they were making a feminist show you know what does it mean to do that well mostly i've played women or girls in my career I did play an eight-year-old black boy in uh, Moby Dick rehearsed in the op- in, in Denver, but that was unique. And I, mostly, I've been asked to play to play women. So if I'm doing it, it's a feminist show. I mean, it's it's about if it's about women, it, it might be about the women standing in the background. <laughs> I mean, but that will give you the you know the the story on the woman of that story. Um, the the, everything having to sit in its own category. This is for girls. This is for boys. This is for black people. This is for Asian folks. This is for the, the bitsing up and categorizing everything. I Here, okay. Here we go. I'll tell you my last idea. Okay. Independence Day, 4th of July. Bombs bursting in air. Um, and I thought, I want a new vacation. I want a new holiday. I want a holiday called Interdependence Day. On Interdependence Day, we celebrate everything that's alike about each other. Everything, everything we have in common. Um, n- no show of military might. No uniforms. No banners. No anthems. Um, no borders. And, and, and any, nothing that smacks of anything that's like a badge or, or a symbol. A just um, interdependence day. I'd like to see us move towards that. Instead of towards the, the disaster of the 21st century, which is tribalism. Factions. My opinion. Yeah. Period. That's it. I got to read your okay. poem. Now, can I read your poem? Oh, yeah, just, yes, okay, let's read poem. Let me read your poem. Tyne <laughs> Daly is going to read us a poem. <laughs> because I like to say, Vista Vajimborska. Um, this is a terrific poem. If I can make it. When, called, oh, because this is what I'm doing now. What I'm doing now is, is, is working with words. And I have been for a while uh, to try and... There's still, Your entire there career, still. you've been working with words. Well, I can't memorize them anymore, so I have to read them, you know. And I and I, but I can still uh, uh, throw the poetry in the room, as we used to say. 
I'm going to, <laughs> this will betray me as a theater actor. I'm going to go to the home of Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontaine. Anybody, raise your hand, never mind. The greatest acting <laughs> couple of the early part of the 20th century. Uh, and uh, they lived in a place called Genesee Depot. And I'm going to do a, a seminar for actors. They all have to have been in the business for more than 20 years. And um, I'm going to try and refresh their spirits in terms of, and find out what they're up to and how it's been for them for these two years of masks. Yes, Thanks. and uh, the name of my seminar is Renewable Energy. Uh, <laughs> oh my God, Tyne Daly! Okay. Okay. You have, a, you have, you have refreshed my spirit today. Oh, I just want you to know that. <laughs> Life while you wait by Vistova Zimborska. Life while you wait. Performance without rehearsal. Body without alterations. Head without premeditation. I know nothing of the role I play. I only know it's mine. I can't exchange it. I have to guess on the spot just what this play is all about. Ill-prepared for the privilege of living, I can barely keep up with the pace that the action demands. I improvise, although I loathe improvisation. I trip at every step over my own ignorance. I can't conceal my hayseed manners. My instincts are for hammy histrionics. Stage fright makes excuses for me, which humiliates me more. Extenuating circumstances strike me as cruel. Words and impulses you can't take back. Stars you'll never get counted. Your character like a raincoat you button on the run. The pitiful results of all this unexpectedness. If I could just rehearse one Wednesday in advance, or repeat a single Thursday that has passed, but here comes Friday with a script I haven't seen. <laughs> Is it fair, I ask, my voice a little hoarse, since I couldn't even clear my throat off stage? You'd be wrong to think that it's just a slapdash quiz taken in makeshift accommodations. Oh, no. I'm standing on the set, and I see how strong it is. The, the props are surprisingly precise. The machine rotating the stage has been around even longer. The farthest galaxies have been turned on. Oh, no. There's no question. This must be the premiere. And whatever I do will become forever what I've done. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was absolutely beautiful. Shimborska. Oh, all right. Will you say the name again? Her name is Vistova. Okay. W I S T A W A. Vistova. Zimborska. S Z Y M B O R S K A. Please tell me you've done audiobooks. I have not. I failed completely. Oh, this is a funny oh. story. They approached me once to do an audiobook uh, for new mothers, and it was a little book of contemplations, you know, so that you could read about. Mm -hmm. I said, if this new mother has 10 minutes a day for herself, she's doing better. She don't need this book. <laughs> <laughs> God bless her. Well, that's when my experience. <laughs> Them 10 minutes don't go until the kid is 35. <laughs> Let's be, let's be serious. <laughs> okay. Oh my goodness. Oh, wow. No, and I tried, I tried, I listened, I got so, we were doing a long distance trip and I got books for the girls to listen to. We were driving my daughter back from school in Wisconsin and I got uh, Ruby D doing their Eyes Are Watching God and I love Ruby D. And her, and we had, I worked for her and, and for Ozzy and stuff and I, I got it. The thing made me fall asleep. <laughs> driving and it was like it was like a sopper I can't yeah. so I say I listen but I can't I, very few books on tape move me I find yeah. it hard to listen to nonfiction audiobooks yeah fiction audiobooks are I find easier to listen yeah. to Maybe well, because it yeah. engages my imagination in a different way yeah. as opposed to trying to take well, in are watching God oh, come on that's wow. yeah, it's yeah. hard to be yeah. for yeah. It's, yeah. uh what else? Jim Dale. Do you have Jim Dale in your mind? Yes. Mm -hmm. He did all of the voices for the Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Yes. Something yes. like 309 <laughs> voices. I thought, Shh, Those, what kind of a thing is that? Those audiobooks are amazing. Yeah. We listen to them and with he, our and, voice. But he and, said he recorded them and managed to remind himself of who everybody was. You know, sometimes he'd lose a voice. 
That yeah, kind of, see, amazing. that t- kind of gift is just amazing to me. Can I ask you really quick? I know yes. we've we, we got to wrap up. Um, the, the Bread Factory, two-part movie, <laughs> like such a charm. Like how did, how did, did that you happen? you have fun with that? I did. I, I saw love- Patrick Wang is a lovely genius filmmaker. You should see his film called In the Family. Oh, yummy. And then there's one called... Uh, the grief of others. But uh, yeah, uh, Bread Factory was uh, shot in under 30 days with 210 speaking parts. It was a miracle. <laughs> Put dancing and singing carrying on and I got to it through my friend, like uh, happens a lot in my business, uh, my friend Brian Murray, gone from us now, but a great actor. And he had done a piece for Patrick in, I'm trying to remember which show, I think it's the, uh, the first one, um, In the Family. It, just lovely. And the two, I, that was such a brilliant, like, Two movie. They you shot both movies at the same we time. We shot them back to back in a breathtaking amount of no time in a tiny and uh, Janine Garofalo. Funny people, yeah. you know, who who just came because they were charmed by the material, basically. Anyway, it was it was uh, a you. favorite. <laughs> Where did you see it? For God's sake, I found it streaming. Okay. Because <laughs> that's the great thing about streaming. You well, can let find us know things where. Somewhere. Will us, let I, us know I will. Where. I will. Yeah. When we do our audiography, yeah. I will. I will. Uh, because I have to look it up again. I, <laughs> I think I have to see it. A bread factory, part one and two. Yeah, it's about a you know a, a local arts center that these two ladies run together and have forever, and, and where kids can draw and paint and sculpt and act and sing and carry on. And it's uh, it's being threatened by a, a consortium of modern entertainers who are pretty electronic. <laughs> Any rate, okay. So it's three questions. You can't name your own shows, but is there an 80s TV ladies driven TV show that resonated with you? And I can remind you of some to get you going, like Golden Girls and Murphy Brown, China Beach, Designing you know, Women, Designing Women uh, Remington, Remington Steel. <laughs> or were you too busy being a mom and making TV? I have never been a regular television watcher. I used to watch my dad. Mm-hmm. Which was kind of interesting because, you know, he'd be yeah. on these, sh- and then there he'd be, and he'd be being, you know, Robert E. Lee, or he'd be being uh, um, Walt Whitman, or he'd be being, well, in those days when they, did, uh, he, he was always somebody, he played, uh, uh, give us Barabbas. He played Barabbas in the, fr- in the uh, you know, uh, he played a lot of different stuff mm-hmm. on a lot of different interesting long fights, and it was very strange to see your dad. I remember my brother Tim, the first time he saw, when he, cause he was, um, 10 years younger than I, but the first time he saw my dad on TV and my dad was being threatened by a bad guy, he freaked out. Oh, I'm sure. He, he couldn't, truth and illusion, he couldn't make the thing, even daddy was sitting next to him and he couldn't make, but we, so, I mean, I watched the rookies regularly because I was home in the 70s. Uh, 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 I haven't owned a television set for about 20 years now. I, I, it's it's a and I don't mean to be th- graceless about it. And Sharon tells me all the time there's such great things on TV and you have to see these shows. I think I saw three Sopranos. You know, I is there an actress? Now, I like those actresses on Designing Women. I thought they were terrific. And, and Sharon's in love with uh, uh, um, what's her face? Who's doing the, her new show? Um, Jane Smart. Jane Smart. Who's a wonderful actress. And occasionally. It's, it sounds like an, I, I sometimes feel I'm an ingrate about this because I do love to go to the theater and I love it when it's good and I love to see the actors afterwards and stuff. But sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Nothing That's to be sorry about. about. Nothing, yeah. 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 Nothing to be sorry about. Well, who's Alan? Right. Alex Trebek. I watch Alex Trebek <laughs> faithfully and go to sleep afterward. He's gone now. What was that? I thought that would be a great job. I would love that job, but they wouldn't let an old lady do it. But I think I would like it. Be, um, trivia. Yeah. Do mm-hmm. you know trivia? Yeah. Is there an actress out there that you wish you could work with or wish you had worked with? Um, I've enjoyed the ones I have worked with that are, that are real famous. I, when I was a kid and came out here, <laughs> um, I was leaving New York with my a three-day-old baby. She'd been born while her father came. He, came, I couldn't, he was out here earning mm-hmm. the money to pay for her. I, um, and I was in the airport and there was this, um, it wasn't Playboy was another kind of men's magazine like that. Less sex and more a, a, a gentleman's GQ? GQ, possibly GQ. Mm. And there was a picture of a woman on the cover, obviously naked, the part we couldn't see, but she was she had her <laughs> stuck in a big uh, trash can. 
And so her legs and her arms and her, you know, were hidden by this uh, corrugated, is that what they're called? Yeah. Galvanized? Galvanized. Mm-hmm. A huge silver trash can. And her, uh, her long hair and her stuff and her, and uh, kind of posed. And the headline was, the California woman threw at 21. <laughs> and I was... <laughs> 21, I'd had my first baby, I was just turned 21, and I was going with my baby to California, and I wondered, why am I going to California if I'm already (laughs) through? And um, then I would sit, and I had my baby, and we had our little thing, and we were had no money, George was working as a janitor, to, and uh, there'd be these fan magazines, and they'd say, and here was the new actress, and here was the next new actress, and here was this other new actress, and all, the, and I kept saying, not me, not me, no, not me again, and 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 I, but I didn't want to be them, I didn't want to turn into Meryl Streep, right? Meryl Streep had already done that, you know. Uh, uh, there's a little. Uh, card that says be yourself everybody else is taken mm-hmm. you know <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and and i did i just wanted to be there with you know in the mix but i didn't want to, i wasn't envious to be somebody else or to admire somebody else not that i haven't had fun in the theater and had people move me and and tell me stories yeah. but i just um i really don't have anybody that i wanted to be like yeah or, or wanted to have their career instead, you know. Uh, I mean, everybody wanted Angela Lansbury's career, but, you know, but I... <laughs> I think a lot of people want your career. <laughs> well, they can't have it. <laughs> You're very good at I'm your almost career. dead. And second of all, it's it taken, you know. There's no repeat. You can't put your foot in the same river twice. All that stuff is true. Yeah. So... <laughs> uh, I love seeing there being more stories for women. I'll tell you that. I love yes. those. I love seeing those those girl cops on LAPD thing and stuff. I mean, there were the, the cracks were being made. I was aware of that, but I didn't have time to sit down and watch it because mm-hmm. I was busy doing it. You know. Yeah. No, that's great. That's great. Last question: What's a moment that you've had that you felt like is this scripted? Am I living in a television moment right now? You you were on set all the time in television moments, but like one moment where you're like. That was so memorable or so like out of... That I felt like I was in a movie, you mean? Or yeah, that I've, yeah. Uh, like a movie or a, a, a television moment of drama. Well, I'll tell you what my brain thinks of because I don't, I'm not quite sure I understand. The, I remember uh, um, uh, George was doing The Rookies and was directing and got me a job. I got the, I had the end because I was married to the co-star. And uh, we were doing a show. We'd been in school together from the time we, I was 17 or 18, and you would, we were just babies. And we were doing a scene which he was also in. He was directing, but he was in it. And he came up and stood up next to me, and I said, hey, baby, it's you and me in the movies. And we had the best laugh. <laughs> you know, that I can tell you. Um, there are moments when it's amazing that you're that you're on the stage or, you know, uh, on the stage, you can't let that awareness in too quickly, or you'll not know what you say next. Uh, <laughs> anyway, rate, this work—it's good work. It's um, you know, lined up with other things to do for a living. It's not—it's not a terrible thing to do. <laughs> thank you so much again. We cannot thank you enough for this. this. Has been it's, fantastic. it's something we've been looking forward to, and it's Ladies. exceeded, I think, our expectations. <laughs> yes. So thank you so much. Okay, cheers. So Time Daily challenged us to come up with one word to describe our time now here in America or on Earth. This first part of the 21st century. This yes. first part oh, in this time period, mm-hmm. the first part of the 21st century. And then we forgot to come back to that to circle back before she left. So I'm going to I'm going to get in touch with her and find out what it was her word. Um, we think we think Kevin thinks it's uh, tribalism. Mm hmm. Which might be right. And um, and now we have to come up with our own. The first word that popped in my head was change. I'm just, I think I found my word. Turmoil. Turmoil. Because from the beginning, first we had 9-11, 2001. Mm. We're still dealing with the ramifications of, of that insanity. Um, we had the historic election of Barack Obama. Mm-hmm. Followed by the kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Obstruction from the right that 
I don't think any of us have experienced in our lifetimes. Maybe there have been periods in the history of our country where similar things have happened, but this is a whole taken to a, it was whole, a whole new, new level, level. Whole new level. And it's only gotten continued to get worse from there. The fact that we went from Barack Obama, in my mind, one of the best presidents, one of the best men that's ever yes. been president of the United States, to arguably the worst person that has ever been put into that job, the worst kind of person that ever could have or should have. This is not about ideology. This is about a person, this, this person. Um, and that, that person can, cause I refuse to say the yes, name. We're not going to speak that name. Um, that person continues to not only be an effective stir, but that there are still so many people who are who have been brainwashed into believing and to sustaining the lies and distortions that he created in his time in office. Yes. He he built a, a cult on hate and uh, vitriol and fear and um and division. Yeah. And continues to work to divide the country. Yeah. And sometimes I'm like, oh, of course, that's who was nominated by a faction of people who want to punish. Like, oh, yeah, you're not going to have a woman president. We're going to give you the worst of men. <laughs> that's exactly what happened. Oh, my gosh. We will take the worst of men over any woman as a payback oh my god Sharon, Sharon just broke her paper clip that's how, that's how that's how wild we're getting here okay all right have you come up with your word well I, I, I the first word was change but it wasn't enough and I, I, I think uh, turmoil is indeed and I and you also reminded me that the 21st century started 20 years ago so I'm also going to say opportunity it's an opportunity for turmoil and crisis and it's an opportunity for change and we've seen both of those in the last 20 years and and we'll see and we know we're not we're not at the end of this we're not at the end of covid we're not at the end of the chaos of the result of the last six years in politics the last 20 years in politics we are also in the middle of this enormous technology change and a speed of information that's unprecedented and that we're not built for, right? Speed of information and disinformation. Yes. And it's a crisis, but it is also an opportunity. It is, we are in this, um, I mean, I'm, I think the word that I can't come up with right now because my brain isn't working is something that represents both of those. Well, because you're right. There always is opportunity in, in chaos and disruption. There's opportunity there. It's just a question of, do you seize that opportunity to make things better? Do you, you know, whether it be something big like the things we've been discussing or even in your life, you, it's hard to see it sometimes. It's hard to believe that it's there, but it, it is there. It can be there. And it's not even so much about the silver lining. It's about when things are breaking apart, it is a moment to rebuild them in a new way mm -hmm. and to decide to do things differently. Um, so I think that question, which again, is sort of resonating from all of the stuff we talked about today, which is how did we get here? Right. That's sort of, we're looking back to be like, how do we get here? And then how do we get out of here? <laughs> I think it's one of the other questions. And it's, it, you know, again, very serious conversation for in mostly a light podcast, but the undercurrent of everything right now is, a struggle to define the new way we are going to be. And because there is opportunity in these crises, because we can recognize things and name them in ways we couldn't, we can recognize that our healthcare system in America is, is not appropriate to the situation. It needs to be different. We can recognize that our involvement in government has to be more for the people, by the people and of the people we can recognize that these things that are breaking down are things 
that we can rebuild in a new way of looking at things. I don't think anybody is interested in doing the same thing. I'm seeing it in theater. You know, um, I'm seeing people take power from their own place that is often a disenfranchised place, but they're now saying, I don't care. We're now going to unionize. I don't care. We're now going to demand not only these rights back, but more rights. And even though there's a lot of work to divide us into these factions, there's a lot of people that are saying, no, more people in in my history than I remember ever are activated, are engaged, are paying attention. And with that attention comes the opportunity. And I, again, I'm seeing really exciting people running for office and really like, amazing people stepping up and finding their voice in their community in a way that I think is not what I saw happen in the eighties when things were falling apart. And in the nineties, when people were sort of ignoring that things had fallen apart (laughs) (laughs) anyway, but we got into a serious vein because I think I'm still searching for my word, but I, if I don't, I'm just going to say opportunity because it's also an opportunity for bad forces. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's an opportunity for everybody. And the question is, is which opportunities are we going to take advantage of and which opportunities are we going to demand change for good? Mm-hmm. We'll see. Now it's your turn, 80s TV ladies listeners. How would you answer Tyne Daly's request? What is your word? What one word describes our time now here in the 21st century so far? Send us your thoughts and your word to 80s TV ladies at gmail.com or contact us through our website or on social media. I don't know, Sharon. Turmoil is a pretty good one. Sadly, yes, I think so. And now it's time for our audiography for websites. Um, first, I want to let you know that you can go to the official Facebook page for Cagney and Lacey, facebook.com slash Cagney and Lacey. There is a Facebook page for Time Daily. Time Daily online facebook.com slash time daily online you can find the bread factory part one and part two at various streaming sites you can stream it for free using your library card or university login at canopy.com that's k-a-n-o-p-y.com and that's for thousands of movies you can also rent or buy it on apple tv it was available on amazon it's currently only available through fandor on amazon right now What's Fandor? I don't know. It's one of those new things. We want to shout out our friends at Rainbow Remix Podcast. South Florida singer, rocker J.D. Danner and podcaster Denise Warner invited us on to their show, which features LGBTQ lifestyle news, music, arts, media, mixology, and so much more. They are delightful and they just loved our show and reached out to us. They had us on their podcast to talk about 80s TV ladies, 80s television, and why we started this podcast. Denise and JD are delightful, and we are going to have them on in a future episode to talk more about queer representation in 80s television. And 70s and 90s. You know, it's Slim Pickens, I realized, which was a little disheartening, but a very vital part of television history, herstory, and all of us story. Check out Rainbow Remix Podcast. A link will be in our audiography. All right. So the books that I'm going to call out today are Remembering Cagney and Lacey with Sharon Gless and Tyne Daly by Brian McFadden. Um, And I'm also going to um, shout out the book that Tyne Daly read to us from. It's called Poems New and Collected. And I'm going to mispronounce this name. This Tava Zimborska. It is the winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature. And I'm going to run out and get it right now (laughs) and then dream of Tyne Daly reading them all to me. Um, And the last book I'm going to shout out today is New Handbook for a Post-Row America by Robin Marty. It's very helpful. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much to our Patreon supporters. Thank you, Michael, Anne, and Kate. Y'all are awesome. If you want to shout out on the show, join our Patreon at patreon.com slash 80s TV ladies. You can get all sorts of cool stuff, but you also can just support us and support us making more episodes. Support at any level is most welcome. And listeners of any kind are most welcome 
and we're grateful to you all. Next episode, we have Cagney herself, the incredible Sharon Glass. I can't wait. Once again, we're just like trifecting. I'm just thrilled that we have another Sharon on the show. There aren't too many of us out there, it seems. It was funny during this episode. Tyne Daly kept saying, well, Sharon says this. I was like, when did they have that conversation? And then I realized she was talking about Sharon Glass because they're all friends and stuff. (laughs) It was a little confusing for me too, occasionally, even though I knew that she was not talking about me. There was a moment where my brain thought, you know, when she mentioned Sharon, of course, I'm the only Sharon in the room. Someday we're going to get you and Sharon Glass in the room together. That'll be very fantastic. And probably at times very confusing. Too many Sharons. (laughs) We hope 80s TV Ladies brings you joy and laughter and lots of fabulous new and old shows to watch, all of which will lead us forward toward being amazing ladies of the 21st century. Like Tyne Daly. I want to be Tyne Lady, but she won't let us because she's Tyne Daly. 